Okay, guys, so I'm going to introduce the speaker real quick. Tonight, Omega Smith, she is an astronomer and planetary manager at UAA. After a brief stint at UAA, she transferred to the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Hilo? Hilo. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm not known for pronouncing things very well, so I apologize ahead of time. Where she got her degree in astrology and physics. Why there? She got involved with research at a few facilities. What I say? Oh my gosh! I, uh... Yeah, yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> but she got her. Uh, she got involved with research at a few faci facilities, including the Gemini Observatory, the Institute for Astronomy, and the Hukukia Telescope. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. Currently, she is working on developing a full, doom, full dome visual. <laughs> yeah, you got me nervous now. Now I'm just like. <laughs> right, yeah, okay, I'll let her do it. All right, thanks, guys. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm currently working at doing a visualizations full dome for the planetarium at UAA, working on making some visualizations for classes, and some of you have seen me actually at planetarium shows, so hi guys, nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm really, really happy to be outside of the dome for a little bit and do another presentation for you guys, especially because I can have a beer in hand for this one, which is really nice, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you guys have know this, but we just visited Pluto for the first time, right? Is that exciting? Yes, woo, Pluto. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be my, my talk. It's exciting things that are coming out every single week. So I'm going to tell you all about Pluto and all about the new things that came out. We just had, we didn't. NASA just came out with their first uh, published paper on all the findings they found from Pluto just last Thursday. So, some really exciting things happening. <laughs> all right, so, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll go over like the basic fundamentals of Pluto, pretty much all the answers to the quiz you just took. And, let's see, okay, first, the discovery. The discovery of Pluto uh, happened at the Lowell Observatory, which I have wonderful pictures here of the Lowell Observatory. It was built in Flagstaff in 1894 by Percival Lowell, who, he was a really famous astronomer who, he had this telescope and he looked at Mars and he thought he saw these features on Mars that he called canals or canali. And he actually thought there was intelligent life on Mars and they built these canals and their civilizations and everything. Well, he just didn't have a very good telescope. Anyway, so he was really, really obsessed with finding planets and he, knew there was some other planet out there past the orbit of Neptune because there's perturbations in the orbits of Neptune and Uranus. So there had to be something influencing them through gravity. Well, he built the telescope, but he did not live long enough to actually find what he called Planet X. But there was a clever young guy named Clyde Tombaugh. So yes, that was one of the answers. You got that answer right? <laughs> so Clyde Tombaugh was not an astronomer. He was just a high school graduate. And he built telescopes out of random things. I wish I knew this guy. He must have been really, really handy. So he built telescopes out of parts to tractors, to lawnmowers, and it was really awesome. And he did his own drawings of planets like Mars and Jupiter. And he sent them into the Lowell Observatory to kind of show off, but also to see if they were correct and everything like that. And they were very, very impressed. So he was shortly hired after that. So he started working at Lowell Observatory in 1929 and started doing planet hunting uh, for Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell actually passed away before he started working there. And so he started doing that. And within one year, he discovered Pluto. And to another question, 1930. Yes. So there he is uh, working with one of his telescopes that he made is a Newtonian telescope. And then the picture on the left is him using his blink comparator, which is actually a really amazing thing that astronomers kind of use today except more of a digital version. And basically what it did is it took pictures 
and it compared them. So pictures between a couple days. So it might be hard to see, but this is like the discovery plate of Pluto. Can you guys see Pluto? Can you find it? So basically what you do is you take a picture of the same area of the sky over a couple of days, and most of the stars are supposed to stay still. If something moves, it's not a star. So on here, there's actually a couple things that move. <laughs> so it's kind of a trick. But uh, you can see there's a top, there's one that moves up and down like that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but that's not Pluto. The Pluto is the really tiny one in the center, which I don't know if this will move further and I can show you guys, but you see it here and there. So you can kind of see Pluto just jump across. So here and there, that is Pluto. Not very big. What's the one? At the top, I actually don't know. I was trying to research and find out what that was. I'm not sure. It might be an asteroid belt object. So I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not entirely sure what that one was. I knew people were going to ask. That's why, that's why I was trying to research it. But not. And the reason why you can see different amount of stars in both of them is because they're both taking different depths. So like one was like a little bit longer exposure time. So you can see dimmer objects in one side the other. But you can still see Pluto right there. Yes, he stared at these for a long time. So he took a huge plate, a photographic plate, and he broke it up into a bunch of pieces and looked at each square at a time. It took him about a week to go through a full entire plate. And this photo was taken on January 23rd and 29th of 1930. And they didn't announce it the actual discovery until March, which is actually uh, the Percival Lowell's birthday, March 13th, I believe. So it's kind of a, it's a cool thing. All right, so this was the first image taken of Pluto. So what have we done since then? Well, not much actually. As of 2007, this was the sharpest image of Pluto. That's 2007, taken by the Keck Observatories in Mauna Kea. And then by the Gemini Telescope. Sharpest image. This is like a headline. Sharpest image of Pluto ever taken. So that's what we had. This is 2012. And then we have the Hubble Space Telescope. Now this one's really amazing. It's just blobs. This is what we knew of Pluto for a long, long time. So this is all we had. So we knew it kind of had color. We did take spectrographs of it so we could tell like the composition. And we knew some other things. So Here's what we knew about Pluto before the New Horizons mission. What we knew, the distance of Pluto, the average distance is 39.5 astronomical units, which is the average distance of the Earth to the Sun, basically about 93 million miles. But Pluto has a very elliptical orbit, so it gets really close. So the closest, the perihelion, is 29.7 astronomical units, and the aphelion is 49.3, so it's a big gap between the closest and the most distant. It also is five light hours away from the sun, so sunlight takes five hours to reach Pluto. Or as compared to Earth, we look at the sun, that's only eight light minutes away, so that light is eight minutes old. Light on Pluto is five hours old. And it has a part-time atmosphere. This sounds interesting, right? So this is kind of where Pluto is more like a comet than a planet. So it's out here in something called the Kuiper Belt, which I'll explain a little bit more later on. And it's just a, basically, it's this belt of objects beyond the orbit of Neptune that are where a lot of our comets come from. So these are really kind of like dirty snowballs out in space. And they come in sometimes, and you've seen a comet. Most of us have seen a comet, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, so when comets come in, um, they get close enough to the sun, they do something called sublimation, where the ice immediately turns into gas. That's where you get the beautiful comet tail coming out. It gets a coma. And uh, it kind of the same thing happens to Pluto, because it gets such a big difference when it comes close to the sun. It heats up enough where it actually gets an atmosphere. Some of the ice starts sublimating into an atmosphere. So we knew it kind of had an atmosphere. And... There's one cool thing I was going to show you guys really quick. Um, this has an atmosphere. It looks it's really cool, but there's something you can do called Pluto time, where you can log on to this website, and you can actually see, hopefully I can get this up here. And luckily, I already have it pulled up. Ah, 
Oh, wonderful. You can plug in your latitude and longitude, and it'll tell you exactly when the next time you can go outside and you can look out and you can actually see the same brightness as you would see in, on Pluto. So if you're on Pluto, it would be just as bright as it would be here in Anchorage at 6.46 tonight. So if you go at 6.46, that's how bright it would be on Pluto. It's kind of cool, right? All right. So what else did we know? You know, my computer takes a long time. And... <laughs> And technology always goes wrong. That's, that's what we know. I have no idea what's going on here. Ah, there we go. Ah, not too long. Okay. So what else do we know? We knew about Pluto. We know that one Pluto year is 248 Earth years. And we know that one Pluto day is 6.4 Earth days. So one rotation of Pluto takes 6.4 of Earth's normal days. And we know you can fit almost 170 Plutos inside of Earth. And I have a really cool graphic for that. <laughs> Look at that, pyramid of Plutos. Just imagine fitting all those on Earth. Yeah, Pluto's not very big. And we know more than that. We know it basically has the same surface area as Russia. That's an interesting fact. Uh, it's only 6.7% of Earth's gravity, so like a 150 pound person would only weigh 10 pounds on Pluto. That would be kind of cool. I always imagine like gymnasts throwing people up in the air. And the density. This is like a little more scientific. The density is 1.88 grams per cubic centimeter. So what does that mean? How about a graph? Let's look at graphs. So here is a density graph of all the planets. So density basically one one gram per cubic centimeter is basically water. So if you have something that's that dense, it's most likely water. Rock is about four to five, and ice and rock is about two. So Pluto is the least dense of all like the rocky icy bodies, the non-gaseous bodies. So we think it's basically water and ice, or kind of like ice and rock, not water, water, but like liquid or frozen water and rock. And Let's see, we actually figured this out because we, uh, we found the, or the moon Charon, and if you know the moon orbiting around, you kind of know the mass, and we could actually tell the diameter of it back in like 1950, I believe it was, with um, Gerard Kuiper, actually found that. So you can kind of guess the, the density, which is really interesting. All right, so last thing, it has moons. That's really cool. Segway. All right. <laughs> if it will go. <laughs> Here we go. Moons. Yay. OK. So the moons of Pluto are amazing. So we have Charon, the largest, which we did not, when we found Pluto, you think you find a really large moon next to it. But no, we didn't find Charon for a while. It was discovered in 1978. It's about half the size of Pluto, but one eighth of the mass. And you can see this comparison here, the size of Pluto, the size of Charon, and someone actually pointed out earlier to me, Charon's about the size of Alaska. That's kind of cool. And then the other thing is because they are so close in size, a lot of astronomers call them a double dwarf planet instead of just a planet with a moon, because they actually orbit each other. So more graphs. You look in the center here, there is the orbit of Pluto and the orbit of Charon, and the center port that they rotate around is actually outside of Pluto. So they orbit around this one little spot here, they each orbit around that. Of course, Pluto's a little bit more massive, so it's, it's a little bit smaller. Charon's is a little bit bigger. There's some vectors for you if you want to look at that. And then the image all the way on the left, that is, well, I guess it would be your right. That is the discovery image of Charon. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> so this is what astronomers have to deal with. They can look at things like that. Well, what happened was um, it was actually uh, James Christie of the Naval Observatory who was looking at Pluto, and he noticed there was like elongation. It almost looked like Pluto had a tumor. But it was only in some of the images. So it's basically we couldn't see the moon away from Pluto because we couldn't get enough resolution. We couldn't get it pinpoint enough. So he noticed that, and he's like, there's got to be something orbiting around. 
And that was how we discovered Sean. There's other moons. Hooray for moons. Hydra and Nix. Both discovered in 2005 by a really... Actually, let's see here. I think it was... I can't remember exactly who this was. So I take that back. So um, they're both really, really, really interesting moons. Um, and here's an artist's interpretation. So this is before we actually flew out to Pluto. This is what we thought they looked like. Very oblong, kind of football shaped. And just, just to give you guys a little thought experiment here. If you close your eyes, just pretend you're all the way out on the moon, Nix. And you're sitting back in your spacesuit. You got a beer because you're tired of drinking recycled urine. And you're watching the sunset. That sounds nice, right? Your spacesuit's really insulated, so you have no idea it's negative 400 degrees outside. And then you're watching the sunset, and then it comes up immediately after, like on the other side, like, like 90 degrees away. And then it goes down, and it comes up behind you. And it's going all over the place. So the moon you're actually on is totally going helter-skelter because, one, it's oblong, so parts of it are actually going to be more gravitationally attracted. And also, it's because of the double planet. Charon and Pluto are so massive compared to each other that the gravitational pull affects all the moons and they're just catty wampus all over the place. They don't know what they're doing, so they don't really have very stable orbits, so things are just going crazy out there. It's pretty cool. I always imagine what it'd be like on one of those moons. And then recently, at least since I got my degree, there's two more moons. Yes. Kerberos and Styx, and here is a really cool uh, GIF of them. You can discover them. See, you think astronomy is really nice. We look through telescopes and sit out all night. You see beautiful stars and galaxies. No, you sit at a computer and you stare at stuff like this. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, there's a lot of processing and you're writing code and yay. But yeah, so. You can barely, barely see those little two moons back there, and that's because they're tiny. So Kerberos is about less than 20 miles across. Styx is really itty bitty, like maybe, they think of like four miles, less than five miles across. And they were just recently named, actually. They were discovered in 2011, 2012, and funny story, William Shatner actually put up a proposal to have Kerberos named Vulcan. And it won in the popular vote with everybody, but the International Astronomical Union likes to disappoint a lot of people. So, we'll get to them later. <laughs> so yes, uh, they named them Kerberos and Styx, which goes along with the naming scheme of Pluto, because Pluto is the god of the underworld, not the dog from Disney. Yes, so moons are great. So here is a really nice graphic. Oh, I love pictures. Nice graphic of the size of moons compared to each other. So we have Charon at the bottom there. Hydra, Nix, the really oblong ones that are really going crazy. Uh, Kerberos, and then the tiny little one, Styx. He's so cute. Yes. Well, um, that might not be the only moons, actually. So we have been measuring those moons pretty regularly, and their orbits are still a little weird, even though they have the double planet. So we're thinking there might even be up to 10 moons of Pluto. Just haven't found them yet. Well, lucky what you got here. Yay! New Horizons. New Horizons is a spacecraft that was sent to the moon. It was launched in January 19, 2006, and it finally got to Pluto just in July 14th this year. So that's nine years, four billion miles, and a lot of downtime. It's kind of rested the whole time. So New Horizons is an amazing spacecraft. A uh, little known fact, actually, Pluto is supposed to be one of the planets uh, visited by the Voyager missions, but it got cut last minute. So we were supposed to visit Pluto in the 70s. We didn't. So we had to wait until now. But it was well worth it because we have better technology now. And so we got some really amazing images, which I will bring up later. So this was January 19, 2006. Not even a year later, these guys, these jerks, <laughs> they all got together. <laughs> Someone likes them over there. Uh, they got together and they decided that 
Pluto is not quite fitting with, with the other planets. One of these things is not like the other. And before this, we found other objects in the Kuiper Belt that are like Pluto and really not like planets, so it was kind of a push to reclassify things. So I know a lot of you might be disappointed that Pluto's not a little planet, but there's a very good reason why we classified it. It's not a demotion, it's not insulting Pluto, it's just making him the king of his own realm. So here is the resolutions. Resolution 5A. Planets and their bodies in the solar system, except satellites, must be defined by three distinct categories in the following way. For some reason, those aren't words. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Uh, well, basically, it must orbit the sun. That's one of the things. It must be big enough to have a spherical shape, and it must clear its neighborhood. So a dwarf planet has not cleared its neighborhood. And there's another, a couple other things, too. Like, if you look at the orbits of our planets, they're pretty well, they're pretty well circular. They're not very elliptical. They go in pretty well on the plane. If you look at the orbit of Pluto, he's not quite, he's doing his own thing. He does not care about the rest of the planets. So all the other objects except satellites orbiting the sun shall be referred collectively as small solar system bodies. Or resolution 6A, dwarf planets. Yeah. Or little planets. That sounds better. So yes, Pluto is a dwarf planet. And a new category of trans-Neptunian objects. There's a couple other words that astronomers use, like Plutodes or different things. Yeah, there's, they had a couple different words they were trying to use. Well, basically, here is a nice demonstration of the orbit of Pluto. So you can see the planets, nice and pretty circular in their own plane. They look pretty you know, good. Then you get Pluto, just doing his own thing. And of course, here is the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt is a big area. It's like the asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter, except further out, past the orbit of Neptune. So Pluto is not alone. Pluto has many, many friends. So Pluto did not clear its neighborhood. So not a planet. Oh, bummer. But it's definitely not alone. Here we have other Kuiper Belt objects. Some of them are dwarf planets, some are still trans-Neptunian planets. So we have Pluto here, which actually does go inside the orbit of Neptune. So sometimes it is closer to the sun than Neptune, because that really eccentric orbit. We have Sedna, we have Makemake, Haumea, Kwawa, which is a very hard thing to learn how to pronounce, and Eris, a lot of different ones. So Pluto is definitely, definitely not alone. And since we made Pluto a dwarf planet, we had to address a couple other things as dwarf planets. So here we have our five wonderful dwarfs. Yes. So we have Pluto and its five moons, maybe more. Ceres, which actually is the one off of the dwarf planets because it lies in the asteroid belt, not the Kuiper belt. And then we have Makemake, Haumea, with its two moons, Hiaki and Namaka and then Eris and Dysonomia, which were formerly known as Xena <laughs> and Capella. <laughs> For about a year, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, the IAU is like, no, we need a better name. So let's talk about the dwarf planets. So here we have Ceres. So if you guys didn't know, also, we just visited this dwarf planet. And we have found a quite interesting bright dot on it that we still do not know what it is. It's kind of cool. Yeah, so here is Ceres. And this image was taken from the dawn satellite that just went there in 2015. Ceres is the Roman goddess of agriculture, discovered way before Pluto because it's way closer, so a lot easier to see. Then we have Eris, discovered in 2005. So Eris is, yeah, this is the one where they discovered it. This image was taken from the Hubble Space Telescope, discovered by Mike Brown, who is really good at discovering dwarf planets. You'll see that in the next couple of slides and the Greek goddess of discord. <laughs> and Haumea, also Mike Brown. Discovered in 2004, this image was, I believe, taken by the Keck telescope. Yeah, and so these are actually different from the normal naming scheme. These are Hawaiian goddesses. So this is the Hawaiian goddess of birth and her two daughters, and Makemake, also Mike Brown. He's really good at finding these. 
And this one was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope too. So this is all we know of these so far. <laughs> so we can't wait to see what those guys are like. And of course, these are just the dwarf planets. We have more than just dwarf planets out there. We have other trans-Neptunian objects, which have very interesting names. So here's all the trans-Neptunian objects you can see. Interesting. I don't have time to talk about all those. So let's move on. <laughs> so not even one year, Pluto was classified as a planet and then declassified as a dwarf planet. So we have not even seen Pluto for an entire Pluto year. So you can see the timeline here. We didn't even really discover it until 1930. So this is the end of the Civil War here. <laughs> and then birth of Percival Lowell, birth of Gerard Kuiper, birth of Clyde Tombaugh, and discovery of Pluto. Then the launch of Sputnik, you can see all the way around. New Horizons was launched in 2006. We finally got to see it all the way on the other side when New Horizons finally was at Pluto. And those are other times are actually like back. So like the US independence, Pluto was all the way back around that way. So not even a full year. Pluto didn't really get a chance, right? Well, still, even though it hasn't been a full year, Pluto really should be a dwarf planet because it is a different kind of planet. And we've discovered a lot since we have been there back in July. So for the exciting part, what have we discovered? <laughs> Apparently, um, there is, this is interesting. <laughs> so what have we discovered? Uh, water ice crust. So it's got water ice on there. And there's convection on the surface. Let's see if this will do a little bit better. OK, so here is a, a cool image of kind of the map of Pluto on top and Charon on the bottom. And they've already kind of labeled things. So this is really hard to see. I'm sorry. I couldn't get a bigger picture. But there's some things called the Cthulhu Regio, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and uh, the Lowell Regio and the Tomba Regio. Yeah, Viking, Terra, really cool. So these are all informal names. They have to go to the IAU, and we know what happens when that happens. <laughs> Probably going to be named something different. And then the, I love this one, Mordor Macula. <laughs> it's not obvious that a bunch of nerds work at NASA, right? <laughs> so that's one of the maps, but this next image is what we have of Pluto now. That is beautiful Pluto, right? Isn't it? It's wonderful. It's got a really cool heart-shaped region. It's got it's so many things going on here, so much more than we actually could expect. So we're just like, let's send something out there and see what's going on. I mean, this is what we had before. <laughs> Big difference to this beautiful, beautiful planet. And here's some really awesome pictures. So there's ice flows, there's glaciers, there's fog, there's sand dunes, well, ice dunes, not sand dunes, and there's this convection going on in ice, which is, we see convection going on in water and stuff bubbling up, but imagine the oceans there are made of ice. So we have glaciers here, we're familiar with glaciers, ice rivers, they move, they flow. Ice on Pluto flows in very interesting ways. Oh, there's so many more good pictures, okay. So here's another one. You can see a really cool thing about uh, these darker regions. Uh, anything that has craters on it, you can tell it's a little bit older because all the planets got cratered. It's just if it replenishes its surface, then it gets rid of those craters. So there's older surface areas, and then there's newer surface areas. And here you can really see some of the convection. I don't know if you guys can really tell the lines between some of the bubbles in the ice there. They go around. So that is like an ocean of ice, and it's flowing. It's really cool. So the ice is mostly made out of like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane ice. But they also know that all those ices are, they're not really stable. They kind of collapse a lot. So there's not a real good reason why they have this structure unless there was H2O ice underneath it. So they think there's a whole huge layer of water ice that makes up basically the bedrock of this planet. Dwarf planet, sorry. I always get those. <laughs> So here's some more images. You can really see the bubbling. Oh, the mountains. Ah, oh, so good. I just stare at this for hours. Oh, OK, I have too many to go. I'm running out of time. This one's really cool. They call it the snake skin area. So this is kind of like the ice dunes. So there is, there's an atmosphere on Pluto. And yeah, the rippling effect, it's, it's so neat. So, so these images are just coming out. 
And we haven't even gotten all the data from this mission. We're not, probably not going to get all of it for at least a year because Pluto's very far away. And it's not very good bandwidth coming from that <laughs> thing. It's going to take a while to get all these images. So there's a lot still coming in every week. And they got the first down leak not even like less than a month ago. So I've been on their website constantly, just looking at all these things. This one's really cool. It's like a little island in the ocean of ice. It's so neat. Sorry, I get really excited about these images. <laughs> so this was just before the, the closest approach um, on July 14th. And this is one of the sharpest images. Uh, so the scale of this is we can um, reveal things about to less than 900 feet across which is actually pretty good when you're flying by a planet at like 30,000 miles an hour. Here's other ones. This one released where uh, you can actually see the flow of the glacier and it's flowing out into the ocean, which is kind of pushing back. So have you ever seen like a river delta? How it does that? Yeah, it's really neat. Okay. Oh, there's so much more, I'm running out of time. This one is really cool. So here we can see fog and haze in the mountains and the ice ocean and the atmosphere. There's haze layers in the atmosphere too. It's so neat. Okay. I wish I could go into more detail, but I want to talk about the atmosphere a little bit more. So Pluto definitely has an atmosphere. Which is interesting because Pluto's actually started to go into its winter. So if you remember that uh, graph, I don't know if I'll be able to pull it up easily. Remember that graph where you saw the year of Pluto going around? Yeah, so when it's closer to the sun, that's the summertime, it's starting to go away from the sun now, it's starting to go into wintertime, and what scientists expected was that wintertime you get colder, things condense, the atmosphere is actually going to freeze and fall down to the surface. It's not doing that. It's actually getting bigger. So that's pretty interesting. You can see the dip. So what happened was the New Horizon spacecraft flew by. It actually did not stop and orbit the planet. It just did a flyby, and then it went behind the planet and turned around and took a picture of the silhouette, which... It's got a blue atmosphere. The atmosphere is made out of nitrogen, which, hey, that sounds familiar, like the Earth. Kind of cool. So and the, the dust particles are a certain structure where it actually reflects a lot of red light, and it has a blue atmosphere. So if you really do go out at like 6.30 tonight, you look outside, that's, well, besides the clouds. It doesn't really have clouds. But that's what it would be like to look outside on Pluto at high noon. That's, okay, so that's Pluto. I have way more images. I have websites for you guys. <coughs> but Charon also. We did a lot of looking at Charon. So we already suspected that Charon was created the same way the Earth's moon was created. There was a big impact and it blew off and accreted around. And this is kind of saying the same thing. There's some really cool structures around. There's like this whole equator long uh, structure that's got mountains on side. It's like a, a canyon that goes all the way around. Pretty neat. You can see a little bit better. Got some more images where you can zoom up really good. You can really see the canyon there. There's older features. There's newer features. I mean, this moon was geologically active. So was Pluto within not too long ago. We're talking about geological time, though, so this is like millions of years, but still really cool. And here is another image. Actually, I think this one might be a movie. Ah, yes! Let's do the fly around of Charon. Let's see if it'll load up. Maybe not. The planet wide canyon. We'll fly through the canyon, that's pretty neat. Um, this is one feature, they're still not sure how it forms. It's a moated mountain. So it's not like a crater. So because when you have a crater, you get the impact crater, and some of that material comes up into a little point in the middle. It's, no, that, that's a mountain, but with a moat around it. So they're not exactly sure how that formed. Still pretty neat. So that's Charon. And we happen to get pictures of some of the other moons. Hydra and Nix. Really cool. Um, so these are the best pictures we got. It's still a lot better than what we had, which is the little pinpoints of light. So uh, we have Nix, looks like a football. It's actually reddish in color. It's got like this red spot right here, which could be formed from who knows. A lot of the, the scientists are thinking it's when the when the moon rotates, that side is rotating along with Pluto, so it might be like picking up more material as it rotates, kind of slamming in like the face side, like, against the river. 
and then Hydra looks like an oven mitt. <laughs> yeah. And one of the conclusions they did publish is really cool because we still don't know a lot about the other trans-Neptunian objects, but this suggests that other Kuiper Belt objects, such as the ones we don't quite know about, are similarly complex in their histories and rival those terrestrial planets such as Mars and, yeah, as Pluto does. So, there is kind of a push for Pluto to become a planet again, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen. All right, well, I think I'm out of time, actually. What? Yeah? Okay, I want to do one more thing, just one last slide for you guys. Um, so just to show you guys the size of the solar system, for those of you who hadn't heard of the Kuiper Belt before, Kuiper Belt's still not the end of our solar system. There is a whole bigger thing out there called the Oort Cloud. So our Kuiper Belt has big objects in it, Pluto and things like that. The Oort Cloud is enormous. It goes all the way out to one light year, which is six trillion miles, which is pretty far out. Um, so if you look at this image here, I know it's really hard to see for you guys in the back. There's a little tiny box right there. That's the Kuiper Belt. This is the Oort Cloud. And it goes all the way around our whole solar system. So this is the material that's left over that got kicked out as the planets were forming because um, of gravitational interactions, but still did not quite leave the gravity effect of the sun. So it's still orbiting the sun. And this is where all of our long period comets come from. So this is still icy snowballs way out there, floating mountains, if you want to call them, um, way, way out there. And they take thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years to make one orbit. Yeah, wait, it's cool. OK, well, I think I'm <laughs> out of time. All right, so um, I'm going to move to my last slide, and then we'll be able to talk about that. There we go. So uh, I got some. Websites for you guys to keep an eye on everything that's going on. The New Horizons mission is not done. It did find another target to go to in the Kuiper Belt. So that's going to be really interesting to see what that is. It's probably going to be like a big style comet, but we have no idea. We don't know about this stuff. This is material that just couldn't, it's like the leftover building blocks of our solar system. So we'll find out a lot about how our solar system got formed when we study these things. And yeah, I thank you guys very much. And if you're interested in other things, I have my contact information down there. Thank you, guys. So, questions and answers. Um, how about you? So we don't actually know what the arc of the size of Pluto looks like. Is there any, uh, are there any plans to send an end of probe to see what it looks like? Ah, so uh, she made a very good point. We don't really know what the other side of Pluto looks like. Are there any other plans to send another probe? Well, we do kind of know what the other side looks like, just not in as good of detail. So if I manage to go back to the map, while we were flying up to Pluto, Pluto was orbiting. So even though we we're further away, we didn't get as good of a detail, but we did get pretty much the whole globe. So here is the whole globe, and you can see there's blurry regions, like the Cthulhu region. Um, so we have seen it, we have mapped the whole thing, it's just not nearly as good a detail, but it's enough for us to really study, and right now there is no plans to go back there anytime soon. Do you have a picture of what the size looks like? That's the only picture I have with me right now, but they do have pictures, like a full globe of Pluto, if you go to those websites at the very end, which I'll put up at the end. Do you have a question back there? Given that the Earth Given that the Earth is roughly pear-shaped? Yeah, it's, exactly it's pretty right. circular. Um, it's pretty circular. Pluto is very circular, too. It's massive enough that its body has gone to a stable circular, circular geometry. Yeah. When a planet clears its neighborhood, where does the stuff go? Yay, I get to use my video. So, I have a planet formation video. Basically, it goes into the planet. So it clears its neighborhood by accreting all that to make the planet bigger. But if it didn't really accrete it, this is a really awesome picture here too. Um, yes, I'm gonna play this video for you here, and this is what happens when a planet clears its neighborhood. So all that dust and gas and rocks and everything accretes 
onto that planet and even comes in from the sides and it clears out that whole area, clears out the orbit. So basically it just, it's big enough where objects will fall into it, like all the small objects and there's no other big objects around there. Yeah. Well, moons actually accrete around the planet. So it's all part of the planet system. Good question? Oh yeah, those moons are not really round. Well, they, yeah, they wobble a lot. I mean, Charon is pretty stable. It's because they orbit around each other, really. Uh, but the other moons are, yeah, they're just going everywhere. Yeah, they're, they're really oblong shaped. Um, their spin is really, really fast, so that might be a part of it. And they're actually, a lot of those other moons are probably captured objects from the Kuiper Belt. Unlike Charon, which was formed from a collision, kind of like our moon was, it's like the moons of Mars, which are captured from the asteroid belt. You had a question back there? Absolutely, very much so. Let's see if I can go back to that slide. I have way too many slides. There we go, yes. So you can see the incline of the orbit of Pluto there. It's not really in line. So here's like the plane of our solar system and Pluto's like that. It's doing its own thing. Oh, sorry. Any question over here? Yeah. So why aren't Sedna and Clara and, the, and other large transneptunian objects also classified as dwarf planets, whereas Eris is? Well, I think it's probably because we don't know very much about them. Like Sedna has a really crazy orbit that goes really far out. So um, I think we just need to study more about them, and they might just need to be classified as even something else, like large transneptunian objects. So it's basically um, a lack of study that they don't really have a classification yet. Okay, way over there. So the, the question is, has Neptune cleared its neighborhood? And it has. It looks like it's in the Kuiper Belt here. That's not a very, okay. So there's, there's other things that lie inside the planets too. There's like uh, different asteroids, but the, it, mostly it has completely cleared its neighborhood. So it's just a bad drawing, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Neptune has cleared its neighborhood. It is definitely a planet. All right, let's see, go you back there. I love that question. Yay. Okay, so the question was, are there any plans to do a New Horizons presentation at the planetarium? And of course there is. Yes, uh, we do have a planetarium movie. It's called Pursuing the Dwarfs. And we do do it. Um, I feel really embarrassed right now because I don't even know when it's happening next and I'm in charge of the schedule. <laughs> if you guys have uh, more information about the planetarium, we have some pamphlets too. Um, but yes, we are doing it and yeah. Doing a presentation in the planetarium is a little bit better than doing it up here. You guys can actually see the little things. Oh, I don't have beer. That's true. I can't drink in the planetarium. <laughs> it says me, actually. No food or drink allowed in there. <laughs> All right, you have another question? That is very true. So she did make a very good point that Earth has not completely cleared its orbit. There's all sorts of near-Earth asteroids things going on. Well, for the most part it has. There is the asteroid belt. There is asteroids kind of littered throughout the solar system. But those are really, really tiny. So they're kind of they're everywhere. They float around. Um, it's not like a whole entire belt of objects. So like Ceres is in the asteroid belts. It's a decent sized dwarf planet. It has asteroids around it, Earth does too, but it has a whole entire belt of asteroids. So it's actually within a belt of asteroids instead of Earth. Some asteroids go a little astray and they will get close to Earth. What's the difference with Pluto? How much more space debris is there around Pluto than around Earth? A lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so enough where we don't really have to worry about like collisions from asteroids anymore. Uh, but there's a lot of things out there in the Kuiper belts, and a lot of them are pretty close, and some of them, like the orbits, if I go back to that, ah, huh, this one. So you see how the orbits 
of Neptune and Uranus are pretty far away from each other, like 20 astronomical units, 30 astronomical units, and the orbits of all the other ones are kind of mixing with each other. Those are big, well, they, know, they never actually um, intersect with each other, they just, they're in the, around the same area. So I don't know if I answered your question well enough, but basically the, the amount of asteroids around Earth is minuscule to the amount of objects around Ceres and Pluto. Like some of those asteroids, of course, gravitational interactions make them go all over the place. Can you get a question in the back there? The main reason is that it has not cleared its neighborhood. So even dwarf planets have to be in orbit around the sun, just like regular planets. Okay. It's, it's actually words now. How did that happen? <laughs> I don't know. It's magic, yeah. So, um, yeah, so it, they, they have no gravity to actually have a nearly round shape and all that. It's... It cannot be a satellite, so it cannot orbit around another planet. But it was mainly the, the clearness neighborhood and also the really highly different, uh, the strange orbit. There we go. Strange orbit, yeah. Yes, that is supposed to be what you can see with your eyes. Really awesome picture right there. Yes. So, I mean, the telescope doesn't have actual eyes. It takes it in different wavelengths, and so the astronomers have to recreate it to be what it would like you to see for your eyes. How much time do I have? Two more questions? Okay, two more questions. Let's go you in the corner there. Well, at least looking at that, Eris, which is, I think, bigger than Pluto, has a very wide... Um, yes. ...out of the Kuiper Belt, so why wouldn't that now qualify as a planet? It's not out of the Kuiper Belt. No, the Kuiper Belt is very big. So it goes from, gosh, yeah, it, it goes a long, long way. Uh, so it actually does, Eris is still inside the Kuiper Belt, even at its furthest point. Sedna is like the one that goes furthest out. So that one is actually not classified as a dwarf planet. But the, the Kuiper Belt goes really, really far um, from basically the orbit of Neptune out to, oh, geez, I think it's like 70 astronomical units. Maybe more than that. It goes out pretty far. So it's very extensive. Okay, one more question. So I'm gonna go with the, <laughs> what's your question? <laughs> That's a really good question also. Oh my God, yes, I can use more of my slides. So the question was, if Pluto does end up clearing its neighborhood, will it be renamed as a planet? Not in our lifetime. <laughs> But I do want to say, um, because Pluto does take so long to, um, to orbit, it takes longer for the planet to fully form. So I mean, Earth, we form pretty quickly. So I'm going to go through this again here. Keep an eye on, I think it has up on the top, the amount of orbits. So this is like within 100 orbits, it really starts clearing its neighborhood and then going and migrating to different ones. So 100 orbits. Pluto has definitely gone through over 100 orbits. And this uh, simulation also is with a planet about twice the size of Jupiter, so it does do accretion a lot faster. But still, I mean, our solar system has been around for 4.5 billion years. It's had enough time. I don't know if it's, it's still things are going on out there because it's the outer parts of the solar system. It takes longer to happen out there, but the likelihood of it actually creating everything is not really going to happen. All right. Okay. That is all the time I have for questions. Thank you guys very much.